Hello, everyone, and welcome back to an all-new episode of The Financial Confessions. It's me, your host, Chelsea Fagan, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet and woman who loves to talk about money. Uh, And today I am really, really excited to have someone on who not only have I personally been watching for a while, uh, but who talks about a lot of topics that are some of, frankly, our favorites to talk about here on TFD. Literally just 10 minutes before sitting down to film this, I was actually working on a script that I'll be recording uh, next month that's all about the current obsession, especially taking place on places like TikTok, uh, with old money aesthetic, the coastal grandma look, like the what you're seeing the Pierce family wear as opposed to the Roy family wearing on Succession. This very specific ideal of money that is in some ways so idealized as to be totally divorced from its class implications. But if we scratch the surface of our obsession with old money aesthetics, we do understand pretty quickly, and we'll obviously get into this in more depth in the video, that there is a very strong class element there, even if we want to pretend it's just about the sweaters tied around your shoulders. Similarly, by chance yesterday, I off the cuff recorded a TikTok about uh, one of my experiences working for a yacht club, which is something that I've spoken about before on this channel. Uh, And it just sort of happened to go off very unexpectedly in the past like 12 hours. It's gotten like half a million views with all kinds of people weighing in with their stories and experiences about having worked at yacht clubs and country clubs. For those who don't know, yacht clubs are essentially country clubs plus boats. But suffice to say, the very specific experience of being not a very wealthy person, but being surrounded by them, working for them, growing up near them, can be extremely disorienting and in many cases cause people to have a lot of complicated relationships with money, wealth, status, appearance, and all of the other things that can't so easily be summed up by just the coastal grandma aesthetic. My guest today is a content creator, but he's also an early childhood educator. He's a nanny, but he also has worked for and grown up alongside many of those social groups that I was just speaking of, despite not belonging to them himself. He is a native New Yorker, and I cannot recommend enough that you guys check out his TikTok. He does absolutely great stuff. Uh, And he's here to talk about all of that and more. Welcome today, my guest, Dutch D. Carvalho. Welcome. Hi, Chelsea. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you. I'd like to thank Nutrafol for supporting TFC. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support TFC by going to Nutrafol.com and entering the promo code TFC to save $10 off your first month subscription plus free shipping on every order. And thanks to ZocDoc for supporting TFC. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who take your insurance and are available when you need them. Go to ZocDoc.com slash TFC and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top rated doctor today. So for those who don't know, can you give us just a really quick synopsis of who you are and a lot of what you talk about on your platform? Sure. So I'm a content creator on TikTok mainly. I also post on Instagram, but it's mostly TikTok. And I'm a born and raised New Yorker, like you said. And I talk mostly about just life in New York, the dynamics of growing up here, what it's like to exist here, and also my experiences as an educator. I work with pre-K and 3K, which are three-year-olds, and my experiences also working as a nanny and things like that. By the way, I'm so sad we couldn't have you in studio today. We are just a stone's throw, but next time. Yes. Um, But you also mention in a lot of your content that growing up in New York, so you grew up, you know, kind of working average class here in New York City um, in an area that, you know, you alluded to before we started filming has since become quite gentrified and we can talk about that. Um, But you mentioned in some of your videos that you, despite not being uh, from a very wealthy, privileged family, actually sort of ended up kind of growing up growing up alongside a lot of those kids uh, in some of the summer camps that you went to. Can you talk a little bit about how you kind of got into that and what the experience was like kind of growing up alongside these kids who were from a very different world? Sure. Yeah, it's really interesting growing up with a lot of proximity to privilege and wealth um, and existing in those spaces when you're not a part of them. It's wild. Um, You sort of feel like an outsider constantly. Um, I will say, though, and I want to preface everything that I say with when I talk about these types of things, which is I was very lucky in that I sort of was this chameleon because while I wasn't wealthy and I accessed a lot of those spaces because I'm white, like people didn't even blink twice. Mm. Once they heard more and sort of caught on after like the first five minutes and they were like, okay, he's not one of us. Like he doesn't have the same things as us, but to be able to even get into those spaces from the first, from like the jump, like that played a major role. So 
that is an important like note that I wanted to make. Um, but growing up in those phases, it was crazy. So I grew up, my mom's a single parent. Um, I grew up in New York and she would just like constantly be finding things for me to do, like anything, like summer camp programs, like, but growing up in New York with one parent raising you is very difficult to pay rent and pay bills and all of that. So she was always trying to find things that like were accessible or had accessible options. And so she would find things like this summer camp where they were specifically looking to get public school students into the summer camp because it was predominantly private school students. And so I went to the summer camp and it was just insane. I mean, like I, like I had never seen anything like it when I first got there. Like I was, you know, like I would bring my lunch from home and other kids would have their nannies or their chefs from their families, like literally drop off lunch at summer camp. Like, um, or, you know, we, the weekend would be coming and where are you going this weekend? I'd be like, oh, I'm going to my dad's apartment. Where's your dad's house? And I'd be like, it's in the city. What are you talking about? Like he lives here, but like they all had like houses that they went to and things like that. So it was just really, um, it was really interesting growing up. I never really wanted to be one of them. I was always very comfortable in, you know, like my family and my friends sort of, I always referred to it as like back home, which is really just like a few blocks away. But um, I loved that and I was very proud of that. And it was also like really wild from a young age to see how vastly different just a few blocks could make or, you know, a few zeros at the end of somebody's family's like income could make. Well, you mentioned, so for those who aren't familiar with uh, New York City geography, so you grew up in the Yorkville to East Harlem area. Um, and Yorkville now, I, I don't know how you would describe Yorkville, but I always think of it as like where like relatively recent graduates that work in finance live because it's like it's the Upper East Side, so it's safe, but it's still more slightly more affordable, but it's become uh, quite gentrified, even pretty far north. Um, but when you were growing up, it definitely was not like that. Um, can you talk a little bit about what your neighborhood was like growing up and what it's been like to see it change to this extent? Sure. So historically, Yorkville is mostly working class families and middle class families. Um, there was historically like a lot of Mitchell Lama housing in the neighborhood, which is a type of affordable middle income housing in New York that got privatized. There's public housing, specifically in my area. Um, and it, was, it used to be like a lot of families. It was just like on like in the like five block radius of like where I grew up, like it used to be much more industrial. There were car washes and it was mostly low rise buildings. I mean, in the five blocks of around where I grew up in the past 10 years, like like seven high rise buildings have gone up, wow. um, which is crazy like that. And they're and they're not affordable. They're not rentals. They're all like condos with starting prices of like two million dollars, one point five million dollars. And so it's really changed from this like very local, there weren't like really many chains, all low rise buildings, like very residential. And in the past few years, it has turned into like condo city. Um, and mm. definitely like a lot more young professionals who have moved here and are living in what were formerly like very affordable uh, buildings that are no longer that affordable. Um, so it's definitely, changed um a lot over the years that i've grown up which has made me sad because a lot of my friends like i so i live in affordable housing mm -hmm. um i got an affordable apartment uh, about a year and a half ago which was an incredibly arduous insane pro yes which was an incredibly arduous insane process that we can talk about but um I, that was the only way i was able to move out of home was because i got an affordable apartment the majority of the people i grew up with they still live at home um because most kids who grew up in new york also support their families. And so to be able to move out and still be able to support your family is just not something that's possible. So most people still live at home, um, which was not the case when like my mom was growing up, like she, the, the first apartment she got, like when she tells me how much the rent was, it's insane. And like, <laughs> and she lived in Yorkville, like she lived in the neighborhood and it was totally way more accessible for her as a 20 something year old than it would be for me and my peers. So, well, on that topic, I mean, so you won the an affordable housing lottery, um, which is something that I think a lot of people don't even know exists because uh, the housing market is not quite as dire in, in other areas as it is in, in Manhattan. I assume, are you still in Manhattan? Yes. 
Okay, so in Manhattan, no less, which is uh, a very, very, very competitive housing market, can you explain what the affordable housing lottery is and how you won it? Sure. So it's actually insane when you break it all down. So there are buildings that go up in the city nowadays. It's And I could go off about how I don't think they're ethical and all of that. But basically, these buildings receive a tax break for setting aside a certain number of apartments to be affordable. This isn't all affordable housing buildings, but the majority of buildings that are built nowadays, 80% of the units are market rate. So that means they could charge three, four, five thousand dollars whatever it is for, you know, like a one bedroom. And then 20% of them are set aside to be affordable. And they, there's a range of affordability based on income. Sometimes affordable looks like seven or eight hundred dollars a month. And sometimes affordable looks like twenty eight hundred, thirty two hundred dollars a month, which again, I don't really think that's affordable and who are those apartments really being built for? It's not working class New Yorkers. But putting that aside, um, these apartments get put into a lottery. So you literally have to like enter your name at how much money you make. And then it's like a literal, like, I mean, I don't think they have one of those like crank things where they like pull <laughs> numbers, but it's like a digital version of that. You get assigned a lottery number and there are literally it's like Hunger Games. There are like 50, 60, 70,000 people applying for like three or four apartments. So I had been doing this process since as soon as I turned 18. Um, and I had applied to literally hundreds of apartments. I had gone through the process four different times because once your lottery number gets called, you have to go through this insanely lengthy process because it's all... Um, in, in essence, subsidized by the government because these buildings are getting tax breaks. It's not actually subsidized by the government, but because it's related to the government, you have to go through this like insane application process. It's like months and months of pay stubs, years of taxes. I think I submitted something like 65 or 75 documents in total, um, just in order to get the apartment. So once your lottery number gets called, you go through this process and you have to submit all these documents, you have to do interviews, you have to do everything. And before I got the apartment that I got, I had been through it four previous times and been rejected every time. Mm. So, because it is so specific, the apartment that I got rejected for before this apartment, um, I was $400 short of the minimum income. Annual? Annually. So I was 400, they rejected me because I was $400 short um, of making enough to live in an affordable apartment. I mean, that's how insane the process is. So with the apartment that I actually got, a lot of times, and again, this harkens back to the idea of affordable housing not being accessible and having to know a lot about it. Um, there's actually a lot of times when buildings have run through all the people in their lottery, and it's been a few years since they built the building, they'll do something called a re-rental, which is basically like they have five affordable apartments that they have to fill, and they just have to post an ad but they could post that ad anywhere. They don't have to like really publicize it that much. And so I would check all of these websites all the time in the building that I'm in now, they just happen to post the ad and I happen to see it on the day that they posted it. And so I submitted my application like that day. And I think I was just one of the first people um, to, to get it. And also I lived in the community board district. A lot of times you get priority if you live in the area that the building is being built in. So I think that helped. And it was about a six month process from when I submitted my application to when I moved in. Wow, that is <laughs> that is incredible. I mean, you know, do you feel, so growing up, I mean, there's something so awful in a lot of ways, and it sometimes can feel inevitable in big cities, but I imagine it must feel strange being someone, cause I've lived in New York for 10 years and I still don't consider myself a New Yorker. I'm like, I have a ways to go, but you're someone who's born and raised here your whole life. And yet it is every year getting harder and harder for you and people like you and people that you grew up with to live here. And on top of that, in some ways, I'm sure you might feel, especially in your old neighborhood, like an outsider compared to, you know, the kind of people who are living here and often people who have very little attachment to the city, who may not be here for long, who don't care that much. Do you find yourself dealing with those emotions and, and how do you deal with them? Yeah, it is something that I deal with a lot. I mean, it, if you know me in person, it's like one thing that Dutch is going to go off about. <laughs> it's New York and um, the displacement of people that live here and 
all of those things. And I talk about that a lot on TikTok, sort of the idea of, because for example, like influencer culture, like New York City influencers, that's a really big thing. They come to the city and their whole identity is built off of living in this city and attending events here and going to restaurants and, and all those types of things. But oftentimes they're not contributing back to the communities in which they live. And I think that's so important. And it is really frustrating for me to see so many people move here, often not stay here and do things like drive up the rents and not contribute to the communities that they live in and always have something to say about the communities they live in too. So it's dirty or somebody was bothering me or, you know, if you choose to move to someplace, I think it's, you know, very important that you also integrate yourself into the community that you become a part of. And so many people that move to New York, I don't think they see New York necessarily as a community. They see it as sort of more like a Disney world or like this fantastical place. Um, but there are very real people here and very real families. And I mean, we have over a million children in our public schools. I once saw a TikTok that was like, there are children in New York. Like this girl was like going off about how like kids were running across the street and she was just trying to get to her job. And I'm like, yeah, there are a million of them just in public school alone, you know? So I think it is really frustrating for me to see it. And one of the things that I do that helps me with my frustration is I talk about it on TikTok. And I've had a lot of people be like, wow, I didn't know that. I also get a lot of pushback. You know, a lot of people say things like you can't blame individuals for things like gentrification. And while I definitely think that landlords and developers and our government are who are mainly responsible for things like gentrification and displacement, I do think individuals, you know, have a role if you move into a neighborhood and you don't frequent the restaurants in your neighborhood. For example, you only frequent restaurants in like Soho or Greenwich Village or something like that. Like that's playing a role. You've moved into a community and you're not actively supporting it. So I definitely get some pushback, but I talk a lot about it on TikTok. I try to, you know, not just, you know, talk the talk, but also walk the walk. So I do things like every year, there's something called a rent guidelines board hearing, which the city can set for certain apartments, how much your rent increases every year. And they actually just came out with what they want to set it to, which is 16%. They want, they're saying that rent stabilized apartments, which are like apartments that have affordable protections, that landlords should be able to raise the rent on them 16% this year, which is diabolical. Um, but every year there are hearings about those rent increases. And so every year I go to them and I talk my talk and you get two minutes and I talk about how much I, you know, don't think these rent increases should happen and things like that. So I try to do things on my end, you know, to feel like I'm fighting the fight in my own neighborhood. And then I think by making the TikToks, that has also helped me honestly a lot with my frustration around it because I feel like it does, you know, educate some people. And even if the people who are actively engaging in things like displacement and gentrification aren't listening to me, there are people who aren't, who might not understand those things. So at least they're now understanding what it means or, or getting better insight or another point of view. Totally. I mean, you know, you work with children quite a bit um, and you were a child in New York City's public school system all your all your child childhood life. I don't know how to say that all your youth, um, you know, and it's interesting. I'm at a time in my life where I my husband and I don't plan on having children, um, but I would say most of the people that I I'm friendly, friends, family, all everyone around me is having children. So I am seeing, you know, for the New Yorkers in my life, kind of that process. And a lot of the people um, I know who've lived in the city, who've had children, have moved out to the suburbs, which I think is a pretty common trajectory. Um, but interestingly, when I've spoken to my friends who I have a few friends now who are either actively in the process or planning very soon to have children and who are actively planning to stay in the city, um, in Manhattan, in Queens, um, what have you. And they've told me that they have gotten a lot of put a lot of pushback, a lot of horrified reactions, a lot of, oh my God, how could you raise a kid in New York City? This, that, and the other. Um, and a lot of perceptions about it. I mean, listen, anyone who lives in New York City gets all kinds of wild perceptions from people who don't live here. That's inevitable. But I think it goes to a whole other level when you're planning on having a child in the city. Um, and I would really be interested to hear your take on both kind of being an educator and a child care provider in the city now, but also the experience of growing up as a little kid in Manhattan and, you know, how you feel about that experience. Sure. So I loved growing up here. You know, it wasn't without its issues or things like that, but I absolutely loved it. I think it's an amazing place to raise kids as well. 
I mean, just from the level of access to things that you have, whether it's all the museums or the free events or the parks, or I mean, granted, we don't have backyards, but like my friends and I would say, like, this city is your backyard. Like, no, I don't have 10 feet of grass outside, but like I could go and do anything, like anywhere in the city. There's so many different things to do. So I personally think it's a fabulous place to grow up. I also think, though, that there are two very different ways of growing up in the city. There is the average working class New Yorker child growing up in the city. And then there's the way that, you know, very wealthy people grow up. And I've seen it myself growing up, but I also see it a lot as an educator and nanny. So I sp spent a lot of years working as a nanny for a few different families, all of whom are of a certain tax bracket. And the access and things that their children naturally just have based on their status and their wealth is vastly different from that of a lot of New York children. And so it is, it is two very different New Yorks and two very different ways of growing up. Like you know, when I grew up, I, when I grew up, I, it was the bus. I took the bus everywhere. The kids I nanny, we take taxis and Ubers everywhere. Um, or some of them even have drivers, you know? So it's just, it's a very different, um, it's two very different ways of growing up. I think that's true of a lot of places in this country. You know, there, a lot of people talk about the unheard third in the city, particularly, which is the one third of people that live in extreme and object poverty who often aren't heard of. And so I sort of think of that as like, you know, not to that extent of the unheard one, you know, of the unheard third, but um, that, you know, there is just two very different Americas. And I don't think that's highlighted any more clearly than here in New York. And so I loved it. As a nanny, it's been wild for me to take kids to the things that I grew up going to. It's really fun. Like, you know, like I go to the zoo and it's like, I grew up going to the zoo and like, it's the same, like, not the same animals, I don't think, but like <laughs> the same like feeding of the animals and things like that. I mean, I don't know how long sheep live, but like I'm assuming <laughs> it's a new sheep that I'm feeding, but I fed the sheep too, you know? So it's really, it's really fun. It's really awesome for me. Um, it's also kind of cool to like sort of live out some of my childhood dreams in a way when I'm taking care of these kids because I've gotten to do some like wild things that I never would have dreamed of doing um, as a child and I get to see them do it. So yeah, I love growing up here. I think there's so much, so many stereotypes about what it means to raise a child in the city. And I think it also harkens back to that idea that I said earlier about people not understanding that New York is a community. Mm -hmm. So just like if you grow up in a suburb, you have a diner that you go to, or I don't know, like, um, I'm thinking of something like iconically suburban, like- A mall. The mall, yeah, exactly, the mall. Like you go to the mall and like, um, we don't necessarily have a mall, but like we had like 86th street or something, which is like where the Panera was and like where all the like shops were, Barnes and Noble, like, and so you would go to 86th street. So we had like things in our community that are the exact same, just slightly different. So yeah, I love growing up here, highly recommend. Obviously it's very difficult, um, it can be extremely difficult, especially if you're a single parent or something like that. Like I every day I'm like, how did my mom make that happen? Like, how does she make it work? Um, because it is also a really difficult place to make it happen, but not for the reasons that I think people think. Mm. We're excited to once again be partnering with Nutrafol here on the Financial Confessions. We actually talk about Nutrafol a lot around the office since our marketing director, Rachel, started using it earlier this year. To be totally honest, hair growth is not something that personally affects me, so I'm happy that we found a product that has had a positive impact for someone else on our team. We all know men experience hair loss, but many women do too, even though it's not as openly spoken about. But here at TFD, we tend to speak pretty openly with each other, and Rachel has openly spoken a lot about dealing with postpartum hair loss, as well as general changes in her hair texture and thickness since giving birth. Earth. After all of her other postpartum symptoms subsided, it's the one that has remained the longest. She's changed up the products she uses and stopped applying heat like hair dryers and curling irons completely, but nothing has made a real impact. She started taking four Nutrafol capsules every morning with breakfast and says she can already see a difference in the amount of hair she's shedding. We love that for her. Nutrafol supports healthy hair growth from within by targeting the five root causes of thinning, stress, hormones, environment, nutrition, and metabolism through whole body health. And in a clinical study, 86% of women reported improved hair growth after six months. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support our show by going to Nutrafol.com and entering the promo code TFC to save $10 off your first month subscription. This offer is only available to U.S. customers for a limited time, plus free shipping on every order. 
Get $10 off at Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code TFC. I want to take a quick pause and thank today's sponsor, ZocDoc. If there's one thing you should actually take the time to do, it's find yourself a good doctor, whether it's for your mental health, your yearly checkup, or a new dentist because you're still going to the same one from your childhood and realize you don't actually like them. Finding the right doctor should not be an overwhelming task. It should actually be the opposite. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient reviewed, take your insurance, are available when you need them, and treat almost every condition under the sun. Instead of going to TikTok for medical advice, no shade because you know I love TikTok, it's just not where I nor you should be seeking out medical advice, I use ZocDoc, literally, I personally do use it, to find the right medical professionals, and you should too. Like I said, I actually use ZocDoc, and honestly, it has been really, really helpful to just keep that entire part of my life totally organized, as it's something that can easily feel overwhelming and become an item on your to-do list that just kind of lingers there forever and gives you anxiety. ZocDoc is honestly the GOAT. And if for whatever reason you're not feeling your best, finding the right care shouldn't take up all your time and energy. That's where ZocDoc comes in to help. Using their free app that millions of users rely on, you can find the right doctor that meets your needs and fits your busy schedule. Here in New York City, some doctors are booked up for weeks, if not months in advance, and that's not particularly helpful when you have something that needs timely attention. With ZocDoc, you can book an appointment with a few taps in their app and choose from thousands of patient-reviewed doctors and specialists, browse doctor profiles, upload and verify your insurance information, and get the care you need in one place. Go to ZocDoc.com TFC and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then book a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash TFC. ZocDoc.com slash TFC. Yeah, you know, it's it's so interesting. You talked about, you know, you have been and, and perhaps still are a nanny for very affluent families. Um, and that was something that I did for years. I worked, I, I grew up kind of similarly. It wasn't a major city, but uh, I was not affluent, but grew up around a lot of extremely affluent people in my adolescent years. Um, and then worked in, you know, the country club, yacht club, that kind of thing. And pretty quickly, I sort of kind of gained an affinity for like, not an affinity necessarily, but like, I just kept working for really rich people because I was like, I kind of just know how to do it. And like you said, there is a certain amount of privilege to being able to move through those spaces, but still sort of, you're not one of them, but you can kind of be alongside them. And I worked for a lot of really, really wealthy families. Um, 100% divorce rate on all the couples I need for. Uh, I guess I'm sort of like a bit of a, a cursed amulet uh, that came into their home for a while. Um, but yeah, suffice to say, like working for all these families that, you know, like you said, like the children live in so many ways, such different lives than the life that I lived. And, you know, I personally found in working for a lot of these very wealthy families that I, as soon as you're kind of in the mix to that extent, it quickly becomes pretty deeply unaspirational for me anyway. Like I would see sort of up close the way, well, first of all, at least in the families that I worked for, both parents were working, you know, easily 60 plus hours a week. Oftentimes, you know, they were both lawyers, they're doctor, you know, they're very, very high earning individuals. Um, but also that there is, I think, a a level of kind of emotional indifference that happens pretty early on when you have such high levels of access to so many things. You know, I'm talking to a three-year-old who flies business class to Singapore for vacation. What the hell is that three-year-old ever going to be impressed by in his life, you know? Um, and so it was a really kind of transformative experience for me, but I often think, well, was my experience just unique and it was just the families I was working for? So I'd really love to hear kind of your holistic thoughts on both the work that you do as a nanny um, and have done, but also your experience having this kind of interesting perspective on the lives of families that you might otherwise never come into contact with. Yeah, well, it's been a while. I've certainly had to sign quite a few NDAs and things like that, you know, because um, discretion is something that is like so highly prized in that industry, especially nannying. Um, it has been really interesting. You know, I've worked for families who have, who are like old money, like the parents come from a lot of money and it's generational. And I've worked for other families who the parents did not come from a lot of money and entered into careers or professions or things like that, where they found themselves making a lot of money. And it was always really interesting to see the differences between the two, because um, 
both families, their three-year-old would fly business class and things like that. But for the family who generationally had a lot of wealth, like it was not seen as something, you know, odd. It was like, of course, because that, that's how they grew up. Like it was totally normal. The fact that we were flying business class, it was like, well, why isn't it private? Like it was always like something more that, you know, it could always be more extravagant basically um, with some of these families. And with the families that I worked for who had sort of become wealthy, there was always sort of an air of uncertainty, like, oh, are we doing this? Like we're, you know, sort of like, you know, and I actually, one of the families that I worked for, um, I, they didn't say this, but I think they specifically hired me because I had worked with, they were a family who had newly come into money and they saw my resume and saw that I'd worked with, you know, all, they're called like ultra high net worth families that UHNW is like the acronym oh that they would use when you get <laughs> hired. Um, and I had worked with some of them. And I think when they saw that I worked with some of them, they hired me because of that, mm. because it was sort of like, oh, he, he sort of knows how to navigate that. And they would never flat out ask me like, well, how did that family do it? But it would sort of be like, have you done this before? Or like, what are some of the, you know, I was in a way this very odd, like I was working for them, but I was sort of like, well, you know, shepherding them into sort of the ways that some of these families do things um, and sort of helping them one, you know, they were going through the preschool process in New York, which is insane. Like for people who don't live in New York, private preschool in the city and private school admissions, it's like getting into Harvard. I mean, kids start like, you have to be in the right mommy and me class. And then you have to like do this and go to this class. And I mean, the child I took care of, I took him to an interview at two and a half, like an, a pre, like a school interview. Oh I took God. him to at two and a half. Um, and I sort of, I had been through it with other families. Um, and so I sort of helped guide this family through the process of like, we'll go to, you know, this is what's gonna happen and da, 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 da. da. And so it was, the, I mean, it was wild seeing. So anyway, to see the difference between the two families has always been really fascinating to me. Um, me personally, similarly to you, I don't, um, I don't aspire to have immense amounts of wealth after seeing it, um, which some people think you would see it and you'd be like, oh my God, that's what I want. What I love like a house in the Hamptons, of course. Like if somebody was like, here's a house in the Hamptons, I'd be like, yeah, yeah I'm taking it. Don't <laughs> mind me, of course. But like, I, I'm not, that's not like what I'm actively seeking. You know, I'm not. And, and if I ever did get to a point where I was, you know, getting a lot of money or something crazy like that, um, I don't think like, well, I'd be redistributing it as much as I could. And I don't, there, there's like a house in the Hamptons. That's like the one thing I want. Like, there's not really <laughs> like a laundry list of things that I have, because once you see it, like it, it doesn't have the same allure. That being said, um, there are a lot of things that I think people who are wealthy, and I saw this a lot, don't understand that their money gives them access to. Mm. That is so basic. That isn't even like a business class seat. It's things like healthcare. Like they don't have to think twice about the doctor that they go and see. While so many of us are like, do they take my insurance? Do I even have insurance? Like just basic things. That's why like I hate when rich people say money doesn't buy happiness. I'm like, okay, sure, of course, but it does buy stability and the, you know, and not having to worry about so many things that they don't a lot of times even know are things that people worry about like so sure money doesn't buy me happiness but money will buy me stability and money will buy me x y and z that will allow me to navigate out of this or navigate out of that so it's been very fascinating seeing i've been very lucky in that all of the families that i've worked that i've worked for have been very caring and very kind and always taking care of me some of the families that i've had to work alongside are not like that at all and a lot of the stories that you hear are very true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. Like it's, I don't know if you have this experience, but I have been to a lot of really 
really ritzy locales in my life. Like I could check off a lot of places on my list of places that I've been, but I'm like, but you don't understand. I was there as a nanny. Like my experience of this place is not at all like the experience that these other people have. And interestingly, when you see it up close, like have you seen the White Lotus? I've seen like an episode, yeah. I love it. I highly recommend it. But one of the most like accurate details about the White Lotus to me is that you have these extremely rich people who go to these like five star luxury hotel like compounds, essentially, and they basically never leave them. They like only use like the hotel spa and restaurant and bar and they like and a lot of people are like, that's so ridiculous. Why would they go all the way to like Sicily or Hawaii or whatever just to stay? And I'm like, that's exactly what they do. And like especially like if you're going to like a ski resort, you wanna make sure that you're only going to like the things that are on the mountain so you see the other people you wanna see. And it's like, it's a whole thing of like people who travel all over the world just to be in the same room with the same people. It's mind boggling. Yes, completely. It's like, so I've spent a lot of summers working out East in the Hamptons and which is a gorgeous place and really beautiful and has lots of small communities and, and also a lot of working class people that have traditionally lived there. It wasn't always like this summer, crazy, insanely rich destination. Um, but it was like a status symbol as to what your house has. Like, does it have a pool? If your, if your summer house didn't have a pool, like you, they wouldn't rent it. Like it has to have a pool. It has to be walking distance to the beach. And so we would go out for a weekend and we wouldn't leave the house. Mm. Like, because the pool was at the house, the beach was walking distance from, there was a path to the beach from the house. They had a chef. So there was no need to get food out or anything like that. And I'd be like, oh, but they're like, the town is so cute or that this is so nice. Like it was, and people would come, like all the friends and things like that would come to the house. Mm -hmm. So like, they would never go out to a restaurant. It was like a status symbol that somebody could come to your house because every, you didn't need, like you were so wealthy that you didn't even need to go to a restaurant because you had a chef, you had a dining room that could seat 20 people. You could hire catering staff for the evening. You had a nanny there to take care of your children and usher them out of the room when it was time. Like, you know, it was like the, I think people think like, wealthy people like insanely wealthy people show off by like going to restaurants like tabloids right like getting paparazzi like going into like nobu or something like some fancy restaurant but that's not it it's having them it's having like a literal restaurant in your house like whenever you want well and it's also i mean what you're describing too is like the experience of never having to see anything or anyone that you don't want to um which is why it always blows my mind that such rich people live in New York City. Cause I'm like, uh, New York City is like the definitional experience of New York City. It's like being around all kinds of people and things that you didn't expect all the time. But to your point, I guess that's why like, you're not on the subway. You're not walking to your destination. No, literally like it, you, I, this one family I worked for, they lived on Park Avenue um, in a you know classic 10. You would come downstairs, the car would be waiting for you. You'd go get in the car and the car would take you to where you were going. You'd get out of the car and walk into the place. And then when it was done, you'd get right back in the car and go right back home. Like there wasn't sort of seeing, you know, and then if I take them to the park, for example, well, you'd walk from park to Madison, which is just as nice, to Fifth, which is just as nice. And then you're in the park with all the kids who also live on park and Madison and Fifth. So even when we were in public, it was not like true public. Um, like this is a funny story that I tell from the summer camp that I went to. Um, they would all go on vacation everywhere. You know, after summer camp, that was a big topic. It's like, where are you going on vacation? And I would say to my dad, like, they're all going on vacation. Like, where should I, we're not going on vacation, right? Like we might do like a night in the Poconos or something. <laughs> and it was like, no, we're not going on vacation, but tell them, that there's a supermarket here called Gristides. It's like been around forever. And he was like, tell them that you're going to the aisles of Gristides. Like, you know, the aisles, <laughs> right? <Wow>. Funny. <laughs> and like, I told a few kids that and they fully believed me because they had never been to a grocery store. It was like oh not gosh. something that they, you know, they had the, the nanny or the housekeeper or whoever they got delivery. I don't know. But like, they just didn't go the grocery stores. They didn't know what Christie's was. Fully believe me. And I know they believe me because if there's one thing rich kids in New York will do, it's call your bluff. 
<laughs> like they are not afraid <laughs> to be like, no, that's not a thing. You're lying. That is hilarious. And also I have to say the the whole aspect of like just getting driven from your apartment to your destination, back to your apartment. I know it's common, but it's like, why are you living a live on a farm if that's what, what you're doing like why would you bother living in an apartment if that is the lifestyle you're going to live um but you know in terms of the shift that you're making now where you know you are this public facing you have like over a million followers on TikTok like you are now creating this very public profile this very large audience which in many cases, in, in many cases, often translates to you know monetary success and increased access and increased privilege and all of these things. Are you? How is the experience so far of navigating this sort of new aspect of your life and the changes that it represents, specifically from a class and economic level? Sure. So I've talked about this a lot. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions around how much money you can make on social media. Um, people see one and a half million followers, which is what I have, and they think one and a half million dollars, right? Like every follower is a dollar. I wish I would have that house in the Hamptons, like, you know, but it, it's not like that. Um, that being said, I have made money off of social media. Like I've started in the past, particularly in the past few months, um, started to do things like brand deals, you know, where you collaborate with a brand, they pay you X amount of money for you to do a TikTok post and things like that. Um, other ways, not just monetary, kind of how you were saying, like the access to things. Like um, I have like just little things. I've been in like restaurants or um, like just the other day I was at this like bakery and they recognized me and they like gave it to me for free, Aww. which is like, I was like, oh, thank you. Like it was very kind, but it was, it's kind of always, I see a lot of people talk about this. They're like, they always give people who, they always give like celebrities free things, but celebrities don't need free things. You know, it was like, so not that I wasn't very happy that they gave me a free cookie, but like, I, I'm at a point where I can now pay for the cookie and, but still I got it for free type of thing, you know, but anyway, I think something that often happens with social media and sort of the class thing is a lot of, especially in New York, a lot of the influencers come from a lot of money. So when sort of the, the pay structure of social media is you get a brand deal, you do the video, and then it's like 60, 90 days until you get paid. So it's not like you're getting like a weekly paycheck or something like that. And it's also based on like when you get a brand deal. Like I could go months and not get a brand deal and then get three. So it's like a very fluctuating income that's not consistent um, until you reach a certain point. But to get to that point, like I've stayed working all my other jobs. And so I, you know, nannying and teaching and all, you know, like all these different things. I worked at a physical therapy place. Like I did front desk, I did billing for them. Like it was always at least two or three jobs and content creating at the same time. And I still work my other jobs while content creating. But a lot of these content creators who take off or who build their platforms, they're able to just create content. Like they don't have the added because they come from money. So they have a cushion or they have people who can support them or things like that. And so they're able to grow their platforms more quickly. They're able, which in turn adds more money, you know, and things like that. And there are so many creators that I'm friends with who come from similar backgrounds to me, who will talk to each other. And it's like, oh, we're really out here hustling. Like, yeah, I got a million followers and I'm still hostessing at Outback Steakhouse, right? Or whatever it is. Like you're, it's this very strange dichotomy or like liminal space to be in where it's like some people with a million and a half followers are making bank and some people with a million and a half followers are not. And then there are some people who, you know, fall in the middle. Um, but in order to get to that point requires a lot of privilege and a lot of stability and things like that, because you're going to grow faster and build a, a you know, a bigger audience and things like that. If you're able to post more consistently and dedicate yourself to creating content and collaborating with other people and all that, if you're teaching every day or you're working every day and you're doing it at nine o'clock at night, you simply can't do that. It's not possible. Um, so it's been really interesting for me seeing that shift, you know, to also to see the amount of money that can be made in social media is insane. Um, you know, it's really, 
that being said, and I always say this, you might make an insane amount of money for one post and the hundred before them, you were making nothing, you know? So it's like, okay, yes, this seems like a crazy number for one video. And I just made 150 that was building my, you know, building the people that follow me and building all of these different things so that that brand would pay me that. And I didn't get paid for those hundred videos or whatever it is. Um, so it's a very interesting thing that I've sort of stepped into that's very different from any other job I've had. You know, nanny, you get typically paid by the hour. Teaching, you get paid, you know, by the day. It's a set salary. Um, so yeah, it's been very, it's been wild for me because I'm, living in an affordable apartment I'm still same old you know like Jenny from the block like I'm still Dutch from the block like it's still the same old me and then I'm gaining access to these spaces as me not as the nanny right or as the scholarship kid and that's really wild you know like last week I got to film this really cool thing and they sent a car for me like a car for me, you know, it was like, (laughs) I took a picture of it and I sent it to my friends and I was like, this is for me. And like my neighbor downstairs was like, who was like Dutch, who are you? Like, who's this car coming for you? Like, it was like, you know, a lot of people are like, it's a car, but for me, it was a really big deal. Yeah. Um, You know, and, and I've, you know, ridden in cars before, but I've never had the car sent for me before. So it's been really insane to see, um, sort of to step into that and see the difference. Um, And it's been a really long journey too. Like I've been doing this now, I mean, not that long, but I've been doing this now for like two and a half years. And it's really only been in the last five to six months that I've started to see like some actual income from it. Wow. Well, on that note, I mean, as I mentioned in the intro and we are doing a video on this soon, or actually it'll probably, it might already be aired by the time. I never know when things are airing. Anyway, at some point in this general vicinity, there's gonna be a video about, the old money obsession, specifically the style and the aesthetic that has really gotten a bit of a chokehold on a lot of uh, TikTok and Instagram. Um, I don't know if you're necessarily being targeted by these things, but I am. Um, I think they were just like, 34 year old woman who wears a lot of neutral colors like here you go girl um but it is massively popular and there's been a lot of you know trend pieces and think pieces and you know as someone who has worked and moved in a lot of those spaces for the majority of your life like why do you think that now it's become such a point of fascination for people yeah i think it's really interesting too because it has become such a fascination for people. I don't get like, I don't get that many old money videos. I think they see, you know, 26 year old New Yorker um, who talks about affordable housing all the time is probably not gonna wanna see a video, you know, about old money. Um, but I do get some, I have gotten some of them. And, you know, I do love like the whole like classic design and things like that. So I love all of that. But I think a lot of people, it's very sort of aspirational. Um, I think people think that it's like, Um, you know, they say like dress for what you want or whatever that saying is like, so I think it's this sort of like very aspirational style thing. I think it's really interesting though, because it's also coming at a time where there is like a lot of things like, um, like eat the rich and like Nepo babies. Like that is such a thing that like, you know, people rightfully so are talking more about how like, you know, certain, you know, people in different industries are having access to those things because they're the child of somebody who's wealthy or things like that. And I feel like those discussions, I mean, granted, I'm not that old, but I feel like those discussions weren't happening like 10, 15 years ago, like at the same level that they are now. So I I think it's really interesting that the old money thing is sort of taking off alongside all of that. Um, It's like two very different uh, places to be in. Um, but I definitely think it's like an obsession. I think it's a style thing. I think it's an aspirational thing. And I think, um, I just think it's really, I'm really fascinated by the fact that those two things are coming out at the same time. I also personally have always found like the very ultra old money people that I have worked for dress like garbage generally. Like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And it's like, that's not even a thing like there is no old money aesthetic like when you get to being really wealthy yeah. like it's like they yeah they dress like garbage and also the wealthiest family I ever worked for insane amounts of money 
house was falling apart. <laughs> like kitchen was from 1960. Like it was not like an insane amount of money. Um, and it was, they were not like gonna spend money on fixing the house. Like it was just not, it, it looked nothing like what you think. Some of them, there was like one family I worked for, they had like a corporate provided apartment, but a lot of them own their apartments and their families would buy them for them. It would be like a gift, um, like a wedding present. Like we bought you, you know, we bought you the 11th floor, you know, like the grandparent, you know, the family would have lived on the seventh floor or whatever it is, you know, because this is like a total side note. But for a lot of these buildings in the city, I don't think this is common, like outside of the city. I don't know. A lot of them are co-ops and they have like boards of like, you know, eight or 10 people. And you literally can't, doesn't matter how much money you have, you could have, you could buy the apartment cash like today and you have to be approved by the board to be able to buy the apartment. And a lot of these boards will say no for very racist, homophobic, xenophobic things. You know, like you basically have to know somebody on the board or they have to, it's a character thing. It has nothing to do. Well, it's not, it really doesn't have to do with your character in a lot of these places, but it's a how you present thing, um, you know, and oh. it has nothing to do with how much money you have. Totally. And I think there's also like, there is sort of almost even amongst the wealthy, I think there can sometimes be a scarcity mindset as opposed to an abundance mindset of like, if you've just been so wealthy for so long and have such, have so much more than you need on so many levels, there's just no need to invest in things in the same way, to enjoy things in the same way, like, because there's always going to be more. Whereas I think a lot of the families that are still striving to an extent, I think there's always sort of that feeling in the back of their mind that like, well, maybe this money will all go away. And to be fair, like on some level, it takes a very high level of wealth for it to calcify to the point that like you would have a hard time running out of it, you know? Yeah, completely. And I mean, I even have that with like, with social, with my, this is on a much smaller scale, but with social media and things like that, once I've started making money off of it, it's like, well, I've kept working on my other jobs because it's like, I don't, I don't know, it could, I might not get a brand deal or it could stop, you know, any day. So it's definitely, which again, go, goes back to that idea of like creators who don't have to worry about that have a very different experience, um, you know, because, oh, it's fine if, you know, being a content creator doesn't work out, like I'll just, mommy can pay for it or whoever, like, you know, we have, I have backup versus like, if you're the one, if you're doing it, like, and it, there's no backup, it's a very different experience. And it definitely that like scarcity sort of like, you know, mindset comes in. Well, I think in some ways that's probably what's most appealing about the old money concept and aesthetic is just the security, just that feeling of total security that really, even to a large extent, money itself can't buy. It has to be like hundreds of years of money to get that level of security. Completely, that's so true. And I also think it's funny like as we've been talking so much about like the wealthy and things like that, I've been thinking so much about like, as a as a person who didn't grow up like that and has worked in those spaces, like I often get asked about that experience. And a lot of times I think like wealthy people ask like, like this is, so I was at a dinner one time nannying and one of the, not the family I worked for, but somebody else, had just come back from like working in like a lower income area of the city. And the wealthy people were like, what was it like there? Like the fascination that like we have with old money, wealthy people kind of have with working class people um, and everyone else. It's like, well, what was it like? It's like seen as this like anthropological uh, expedition. Like what are working class people like? Not all wealthy people. There are a lot of wealthy people I think who could care less. Just like there are a lot of working class people who could care less about wealthy people. Um, but I just think it's so interesting, both people's upset, not obsessions, but curiosity with how the other, you know, how the other half lives or how, you know, each group is so different um, is really fascinating to me. It was, I thought you were going to be like, and someone turned to me and they were like, and how are the accommodations in steerage, Mr. Dawson? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I, I have had a few moments like that. Um, definitely had had a few moments like that which have not been pleasant but i try not to think about them and it's never been for the families that i've worked for it's always been um 
you know, the families that I've had to work alongside, it's shocking the things that people will say and do, or will say and do like, you're not even there. Like, I don't know if you have had this, like having worked with a lot of like, well, in a lot of wealthy settings, it's this very fine line between like you're visible and you're invisible. So like you're, you're visible when you're there to serve and you're invisible otherwise, especially as a nanny, like you have to, when you, I've lived in with families, which basically means you live in, you live with the family. And it's this very fine line of like, okay, do I step in and work with the child or am I going to let, you know, the dad play this game? but I'm also here to work and get paid. So if I'm not playing with the child, like that's kind of my job. So, you know, it's this very fine line. And a lot of times I'd be at these events and I'd be visible as the nanny, but then they'd be having these conversations about what were, you know, like, oh, for some foundation that they're running that helps, you know, kids in the city gain access to books. And they'd be talking about not just families that live in the city, but families that I've lived alongside in the city but I wasn't, I wasn't in the room. I was, but I wasn't, you know, it's like, oh. you're, that's when I would become invisible. So it's, it's really interesting. I have been party to some of the most brutal marital fights that I think anyone could possibly imagine. Like I have, these eyes and these ears have taken in sights and sounds between married couples that I just shudder to think back upon. And truly it is that energy of like, oh, they fully don't care that I can hear every part of this. It's like not, it doesn't even register to them um, that I'm right here and I can hear it. Um, but so to end on a very sweet note, because we have talked about some not as sweet things, um, tell us just one thing that you love about being uh, a pre and three pre K and three K teacher. Oh, I love my kids. I love all the kids, the kids that I've nannied for and the kids that I get to teach. They are fabulous. They are so warm. They are so fun. We do this thing every week. I do this thing every week with my students and we do affirmations. So um, I like, you know, we have, I, I am proud, I am kind, I am a good friend, like all these different things. And they are so into it. Like they, and they like, if I like shout it, they shout it. And if I go like quiet, they go quiet. Like they're just like so into like matching my excitement and matching my tone. And I think that's what's so beautiful about children and three-year-olds and four-year-olds and things like that is they are so excited about the world and so excited to see what's out there. And it's just so amazing to get to see that every day and to, and to be somebody that they look to, to bring excitement into their world is an honor and something that I cherish every day. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so sweet. I don't know if you saw it, but there was this video that went around in February um, with this, I guess he's like a kindergarten teacher and he was filming himself, obviously he's not showing the class, but he was like, students today we're going to be making and like with every it was there he was making mardi gras masks with his right, ah! yes. but like every word he's like today ah, we will and like you can hear all their little gasps it's so cute yeah it's so much fun creating excitement for them and it's like a total ego boost oh my gosh like if you leave out of there like oh i can make magic like <laughs> i can do anything it's awesome and then you go on to tiktok and have like user three four seven eight nine like saying the <laughs> worst thing you've ever heard being like you i hate your voice you sound like the gay fran drescher or something and it's like well yeah i do um <laughs> so <laughs> yeah uh, well, thank you so much. This has been such a fun conversation as I knew it would be. Um, for those of us in the audience would love to hear more from you. Where should they go? They can go to TikTok or Instagram. It's at Dutch, D-E, and then three C, 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 C. And I'm starting a podcast of my own soon, which I'm really excited about. I know everybody does that, but I'm really excited. And it's going to be called Simply Reflecting. So I'm super Aww. excited to start that. I will be seated and tuned in. Awesome. I can't wait for it. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. And thank you guys all at home for tuning in. I will see you next Monday on an all new episode of the Financial Confessions. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.